this is an article that I wrote uh, sort of exploring the uh, phrase, whether things on earth are things in heaven, which is taken from Colossians 1, 19 through 20, which says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, talking about Jesus Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, I ran across this verse again the other day, and it, it made me stop and think. Why would Jesus Christ have to reconcile things in heaven? I understand fully why he had to do that on earth, where sin took control, as well as the physical universe, which was also affected by sin. But the third heaven? In looking at the various commentaries on this subject, it's apparent that people have different ideas about what this means. Let's look at some of those. First, from Barnes New Testament notes, quote, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, that is to produce harmony between the things in earth and heaven and in earth, so that all things shall be reconciled to him, or so that there shall be harmony between heaven and earth. The meaning is not that the things in heaven were alienated from God, but the, that there was alienation in the universe which affected heaven, and the object was to produce again universal concord and love. That has some good truth in it. Family New Testament notes says this, made peace, open the way for peace. Things in earth, things in heaven, that the opposition between heaven and earth, which sin has occasion, may be removed in all things in heaven and earth may be united under Christ as their head in one harmonious body. And that's a good comment as well. From John Gill Expositor, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, by which are intended not the whole universe and fabric of the world, all creatures and things, animate and inanimate, uh, rational and irrational, which have been cursed for sin, for the sin of man and have proven unfriendly to him. But in consequence of redemption and reconciliation by Christ, will, as some think, in the time of the restitution of all things be restored to their former state and to their friendly use to mankind, nor elect men or elect angels and their recognition together for the apostles not speaking of the reconciling of these things together, but of the reconciling of them to God, which though it is true of elect men, is not of elect angels, who never fell, and though they have confirmed confirming grace, yet not reconciling grace from Christ, which they never needed, nor Jews and Gentiles, for though it's true that God was in Christ reconciling the world of the Gentiles as well as the Jews to himself, and the chosen of God among uh, both are actually reconciled by God uh, by the death of Christ. Yet the one are never called things in heaven or the other things on earth in distinction from an opposition to each other. But rather all the elect of God are here met. The family of God in heaven and earth, all the saints that were then in heaven when actual reconciliation was made by the blood of Christ and who went thither upon the, the foot of peace, reconciliation, and redemption to be made by his sacrifice and death, and all the chosen ones that were or should be on the face of the earth until the time of the end. All these were reconciled to God by Christ. And then the apostle proceeds particularly to mention the Colossians also uh, are, as also being uh, instances of his grace, goodwill, and pleasure of God by Christ. Well, you know, there are some good points in the commentaries that I just read, uh, one of which is that Jesus Christ has and will continue to have supremacy in all things in heaven and on earth. Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. That's contextual. But they did not spe specifically address the issue of the son reconciling to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. 
This bears consideration and explanation because we do not consider things in the third heaven in need of reconciliation. Since the fallen angels will not be reconciled and the angels need no reconciliation because they did not sin, then what is this addressing? We need to reconcile this statement to be able to understand in what sense there's anything in heaven that needed reconciliation. Otherwise, this statement makes no sense. You'll remember when Jesus died to provide salvation and eternal life to those who would believe. He also descended into Hades, into the bosom of Abraham, to tell the Old Testament saints what he had done. Why did he do that? Because they need to understand that what they were looking forward to uh, would, that would provide final salvation and reward was fulfilled in him. They ultimately needed the perfect sacrifice for sin. Hebrews 11.10, for he, Abraham, was looking forward to the city with foundation, whose art, foundations, whose architect and builder is God. We who came after Christ, Jew and Gentile, are looking forward to heaven, just as our forefathers in the faith were. 2 Peter 3.13, but in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, this doesn't mean that people post-Christ can be saved by general revelation. The patriarchs of the faith were saved by faith, not by works of law, since actually some of them preceded the law, such as Abel, Enoch, Noah, and others. All those mentioned in Hebrews were in the line of Adam to Noah, and then Noah through Shem to Abraham, and finally to Israel. God set a line of people who knew God and who would eventually become the lineage of Jesus and Israel, God's chosen people. Those patriarchs were God's chosen also through faith. In the end, it will be seen that all who are saved are saved by faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's proven that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone for all eternity. So Jesus, before his resurrection, went to Hades to take those in the bosom of Abraham, those in the faith, to heaven. That's Ephesians 4, 8. Therefore, those Old Testament saints, saints are justified by Christ fully in the afterlife. So they no longer need to wait in Hades, but are to be taken to, were taken to heaven by Christ. I need to reiterate at this juncture that Jesus did not descend into hell, the lake of fire, or Gehenna, but into Hades, the holding place of souls, the lower earthly regions into the bosom of Abraham. The believers part of Hades also heard the same announcement, Ephesians 4, 9 through 10. What, the, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, I wrote this before. It's important to, that we understand what Ephesians 9 through 10 is talking about. Jesus descended into the lower earthly regions upon his death, Hades or Sheol. He did not descend into hell. Hell is the lake of fire, or Gehenna. No one is in hell until the Antichrist and false prophet are first thrown there in Revelation 20.10. Then Satan, then the demons, and finally the unbelievers on Judgment Day, Revelation 21.8. Jesus descended into Hades. The Bible indicates he went to Hades, to the bosom of Abraham, Luke 16, 19 through 31, where the Old Testament saints were waiting for him. In Luke, it is sometimes translated as hell, but the actual Greek word is Hades, the holding place. Jesus then told the saints in Hades uh, with Abraham of his death and resurrection plan, 1 Peter 4, 6. He then took the Old Testament saints to heaven with him, Ephesians 4, 8. The Bible also states that the others, those who were in the other part of Hades, Luke 16, 19 through 31, held till just judgment day, also heard the gospel, 
1 Peter 3.19, so that they would have no excuse on judgment day what would stand condemned. It was too late for them because they had no faith in God while they were alive, like the Old uh, Testament saints did. And that's in my Ephesians study. I believe that Colossians 1.20 is referring to the Old Testament saints now in heaven who were looking forward to the Messiah and had faith in the Messiah to come, as it states in Hebrews. Those are the things reconciled in heaven. Hebrews 11, 1 through 2. Now faith is co confidence mm. in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were con uh, commended for. Hebrews lists many of those who had faith and therefore the assurance of salvation because they were looking forward to uh, a Messiah they had not yet seen. Isaiah seven fourteen. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, for a good reference on the uh, anticipation of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament, you might want to read the article, The Anticipation of Israel's Messiah by Bob Deffenbaugh. You know, they were foreknown and predestined to salvation because of their forward-looking faith by Jesus Christ. Uh, was tasked, and he was tasked with descending to Hades to let them know that he had accomplished their salvation and eternal life through his blood and soon to happen resurrection. When you understand what Colossians 1.20 is referencing, then it's easy to understand. Here are a few commentaries I think that got it right. There may be others. This is a case in point for studying the Bible by comparing translations, researching the original languages, and seeing what various commentaries state, since many times they're different on difficult verses. First of all, from a 1599 Geneva Bible footnotes. Quote, now he teaches how Christ executed that office which his father gave and commanded to him, that is, by suffering the death of the cross, which was joined with the curse of God, or according to his decree, that by his sacrifice he might reconcile to his father all men, both those who believe in the Christ to come and were already under the hope gathered into heaven, as well as those who should upon the earth believe in him afterwards. And is, in this way, justification is described by the apostle, which is, one, uh, which is one and the chiefest part of the benefit of Christ. Also, Adam Clark commentary says this, quote, if the phrase be not a kind of collective phrase to signify all the world or all mankind, as Dr. Hammond supposed, the things in heaven may refer, according to some, to those persons who died under the Old Testament dispensation and who could not have a title to glory but through the sacrificial death of Christ. And the apostle may have intended those, these merely to show that without this sacrifice, no human beings could be saved, not only those who were uh, then on the earth and to whom their successive generations the gospel should be preached, but even those who had died before the incarnation, and as those of them that were uh, faithful were now in a state of blessedness, they could not have arrived there but through the blood of the cross, for the blood of calves and goats could not take away sin. And finally, in Wesley's explanatory notes, he says this, quote, through the blood of the cross, the blood shed thereon, whereon uh, whether things on earth, there, here the enmity began, therefore this is mentioned first, or things in heaven, those who are now in paradise, 
the saints who died before Christ came. Thank you.